Hello everyone, Vanguard of Valor here, and welcome back to another episode of 80 Days. We're making incredible time around the world here as we survived our terrible Arctic disaster with all the way made to Canada now with only 36 days spent. Things are going quite well. While we're here though, we're going to stop in in the market and buy some supplies for the next leg of our trip. We're going to buy ourselves uh, an accordion for the road. And while we're here, we'll also buy a cotton flower. And why not also grab ourselves maybe a railway cap or some driving goggles? I have a feeling these things will be va valuable to us. We'll pick up a few of them here. This one costs nothing, as far as I can tell. Zero dollars. I'll take them. A railway cap, some driving goggles. We could use some supplies like this. There we go. And I think that'll be fine for now. Meanwhile, it's time for us to explore Gastown and see what mysteries this city holds. We found some new routes. Nothing particularly useful to us. We don't want to head down to San Francisco right now. Gastown was supposedly named after one Gassy Jack, a Yorkshire steamboat captain turned barkeep. It served as a drinking hole for loggers and fishermen from inland, as well as the sailors and air crews of the ships drawn to the Burrand Inlet for trade. It was a rough and ready sort of place. And I was in the mood to enjoy its simple, largely alcoholic pleasures, and celebrate the simple joys of being alive, especially after that adventure we've just been through. We fell into conversation with a logger, but she was a woman of few words and fewer than the normal number of fingers, with which she nursed one beer after another. The one luxury in the town was its distributed steam heating system. Steam hissed warmly through grates in the town's pavements, and even powered a steam clock which whistled the time to the town's citizens every hour. A strange symbol of society's progress, but one that was no doubt as potent as the newly built depot for Canadian Pacific Railway parallel to Walter Street. Gastown was, for better or worse, a truly modern town. Well then, if we take a look at our planning, what do we have here? Probably what we'll do is we'll take the next uh, train trip to Winnipeg. Can we get one train there? Departs in two days for Winnipeg. Okay. Interesting. So it looks like it's the same train, and we can take it along this whole route. This is an interesting thing as well. Using our gear, we have the ability to potentially negotiate a faster departure time. So say we wanted to leave for Winnipeg right now. If we decided to negotiate the travel, the railway cap from our railway, railway man set to help them change their minds to hopefully speed it up, if we do, it would cost us $450 and a further 1,000 pounds, in fact, to leave tomorrow. And I think not. That is not what we're looking for. So what we'll do is we'll sleep here. Turns out speeding up the trains is not an easy task. Before retiring, I went out to explore a little and took full advantage of some time away from my master. When I returned, both my spirits and, I fancy, his were much improved. <laughs> Apparently, Fogg is not a big fan of the Demian Accordion. That's fine. If we had to depart here today in the morning, the friend San Francisco Gyrocopter leaves now at 8am, but we're not interested in that. We're interested in the train tomorrow. If we try and negotiate an altered time today, it doesn't make it any easier. So we're going to have to spend another day in Gastown, but that's not terrible. That's not terrible at all. The market now only has the wind scarf, but I think I'll pass on this. We could sell our Norwegian chess set. I don't think we're going to sell it for much more than we have here. And that would let us buy a wind scarf at a nice little profit. I think I'll trade them out. There we go. Gassy Jack Dayton's Saloon. Now we have a nice selection of supplies, some of which we can sell for more things, and some of which should make our traveling easier later. We have a completed dusty road set now, so dirt road journeys should be a little bit easier to drive on, and we should be able to negotiate them a little bit easier. For now, though, I think it's time we just sleep away the day. Spend the day in waiting. We took a room and settled in. I helped the kitchen staff to clean, earning 85 pounds in fees and tips. Our funds have gone up somewhat, and our relations with Fog have strengthened slightly. It is now time for us to depart, however. We are heading to Winnipeg, and we embark. We have plenty of uh, 
survival against warm or against the cold weather here, so we should have no troubles. On the Canadian Pacific Railway. The conductor, a dark-haired First Nations woman, eyed me dubiously. First time on the Canadian Pacific Railway? she asked. Is it so obvious? She refrained from rolling her eyes. The line runs from Gastown all the way to Ottawa, though you have to change at Winnipeg. It's the first transcontinental railway in the Dominion of Canada. She paused, fixing me with a look. We're going around the world, I replied. So this line will be most advantageous to us. She was nonplussed. The railway isn't owned by the government or a private company, but by the Blackfoot Confederacy. This here is First Nations territory, so no smoking, no liquor, and no firearms, you hear? Yes, madam, I nodded, not wanting to find myself on this formidable woman's bad side. Indeed, she quite reminded me of my dear old mamma. The steam whistle sounded twice, and I hurried back to Monsieur Fogg as we pulled out of the station. Our cash reserves are indeed running low, but we should hopefully be able to make some uh, returns here with the goods we picked up along the way. The train began its journey, but it was only once we were underway that we realized the terrible truth. The train, although comfortable, was slow, and a full journey across Canada was going to take over a week. Not including times for changes, we began to consider most seriously the options of stopping halfway and finding other ways forward instead. We may, but we've made very good time up to this point, so I'm not too worried about being a little bit slow as we cross Canada here especially given how well we've done so far. Monsieur Fogg and I were in a shared carriage, and I found my eye caught by a quiet Métis woman, a large-shouldered fellow. A quiet Métis woman with two surly teenagers in tow. I tried to engage the teenagers in conversation, but to little avail. The woman shot me a look halfway between apology and despair. Sorry, monsieur, my brothers just get worse every year. So you're in charge of them for now, the girl snorted. For what it's worth, they only ever listen to Papa, and he is... Well, he's gone now. She turned away, biting her lip. That rather put paid to any further conversation. I contented myself with looking out of the window at the passing countryside, ignoring the heaviness in the air. And we've made our way to Calgary, what do you know? The train stopped briefly at Calgary, and the Métis woman disembarked. She caught my eye through the carriage window and gave me a friendly wave, while her surly brothers merely nodded. The conductor stomped through the train, checking tickets and checking, catching chronic smokers huddled near the conveniences. We could stop here, briefly, and sell some things in Calgary. I believe we have some gear worth selling, but I don't know if we'll have to pay to get back on the train. And at the moment, I think staying on the train is the most important thing we can do, so we stayed on board. The steam whistle blew. Next stop, Regina, she announced, as the engines roared to life and carried us into the shadow of the Rockies. I would have loved to have stopped in Calgary and see what interesting things were going on there, but I have a feeling we don't really want to have to pay for another ticket. We'll stop in Winnipeg and see what happens there. Maybe some of those supplies we bought would have been better spent earlier, but so it goes. We arrive right past Regina. We're not stopping there, apparently. The lunch carriage was abuzz with gossip. Bowls of soup lay cooling and unserved as the waiters exchanged the latest news for the passengers. I drifted towards one of the tables, hoping to overhear something. My subtlety proved entirely unnecessary. A young Kainai waiter with a stylish leather jacket practically vibrated with eagerness to update me. Oh, sir, one of the passengers spotted it this morning. The... His voice dripped dramatically. Kawoka Otunwe. Ooh, I exclaimed, responding to the drama of his tone before the words registered. My shoulders slumped. Uh, c'est quoi? The waiter slowed his pronunciation. Kawoka Otunwe. It means floating village in Lakota. Where was it spotted? Oh, sir, some say it's a myth, a village that floats in the sky. But look! 
The man completely ignored me, pointing out of the carriage window and garnering the interest of several onlookers. It was seen near Regina by someone on this very train only this morning. Who saw it then? I asked mildly. The waiter, of course, ignored me and beckoned to one of his friends. The second waiter seemed as overexcited as the first. Oh, yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's true. He lowered his voice and beckoned us closer. I pressed closer, eagerly, and he continued in hushed tones. The floating village was built by the Sioux, but it is a place for all whose people are oppressed and whose lands are encroached upon. It is a place where peoples of different tribes and bands and races may come together in peace and secrecy. The head cook seized both gossiping waiters by the ear and dragged them off before they could, con could continue. I wondered what Monsieur Fogg would make of such strange tales. The previous day's gossip had not died down by the time we reached Regina. Monsieur Fogg seemed uncharacteristically pensive, and I inquired into the matter obliquely. My master would certainly not admit to any feelings if confronted directly. "'Do you wish to disembark here?' I asked him. He considered the matter for a moment, then nodded sharply. "'A capital idea!' And that was that. We quickly gathered our things. "'I wonder if there really is such a thing as a floating village.' Uh, rather, "'I wonder if there really is such a thing as a floating village,' he murmured, and then seemed to shake himself. "'Come along, Passepartout,' he said sharply. "'There is much to do.' Zut alors, how I worry for my master with each passing day. Well, we're going back to Regina. Alrighty, I guess that explains why we didn't stop here. Well, we might be able to see what we can sell here tomorrow, and then we can explore the mysteries of this floating city. It'll slow us down, but hopefully it won't slow us down unreasonably. Monsieur Fogg and I have been banned from ever returning to the town of Regina. Parbleu, I am veritably seething from the injustice as I write this faithful record of what transpired. Truly, it was a most dreadful misunderstanding, the kind that can haunt a man for years afterwards. It began with a punch. I neither threw the punch, nor was I in its path, but I did, unfortunately, happen across an alley in time to witness it. It was three against one, an unfair fight, and the victim went down on went down with a hard thump, blood spraying against the wall. I caught a glimpse of pain in those dark eyes before they shuttered closed, and the man's assailants began to kick the prone man's form. All four of the men were First Nations, though the victim was dressed in a coat, jacket, and cowboy, j cowboy boots, hair cropped close, while his attackers were in traditional clothes, hair in braids under their thick hoods. I admit I cursed under my breath at the sight before, shouting at them to stop. They barely looked up, and the meanest-looking one of the bunch aimed a particularly vicious kick at the fallen man's head. I threw myself over the injured man, and felt the kick that was meant for him land squarely between my ribs. Rough hands pulled me from the floor and shoved me back. The fight was on. I managed to distract them from their prone target, and held my own remarkably well against their attacks. But it was three against one, again, and only a matter of time before they took me down. I resigned myself to the eventuality. I had known the price of intervention when I had made my decision, and I did not regret it in the least. But then a sharp whistle interrupted my musings and stilled the fists flying at my head. Well, 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 a rough American-accented voice drawled. Looks like we got here just in time. Stupid of you boys to go after one of my interpreters and beat up a white man besides. You'll be strung up for that alone. I bristled a little at the racist implication. The men were in the wrong for attacking three-on-one, not because their victim was white, I did not care to find myself in solidarity with one of such opinions. Hmm. But I did rather need to be rescued, or but neither did I think much of my assailants. No, we're going to decide to defend our attackers. My potential rescuers. Mama had raised a fool, but an honorable one. I crossed my arms and raised an eyebrow. You have it wrong, monsieur. This is all a misunderstanding. The three rough-looking white fellows chuckled and rolled their eyes. Goddamn Canadians, one of them muttered. No idea how to treat the natives. 
Show a little respect, I narrowed my eyes. This was their land first, was it not? My erstwhile attackers were looking at me with outright amazement on their faces, though I have no idea whether it was because they thought me brave or unutterably stupid. Probably the latter. Hmm. I shrugged apologetically, and they looked even more baffled. The man nearest to me elbowed me in my rather tender ribs. Shut your mouth, white man, he whispered. You're going to get us all killed. You wouldn't dare, I retorted. The man sighed and pushed a long braid back from his face. Be on your guard. These men are not to be trusted, he said, and explained the situation. The Americans turned out to be whiskey traders. The fellow who had been jumped was a Cree man they used as a go-between. Apparently, he had been trying to sell liquor illegally to some of the First Nations teenagers at the nearby Tsutina Retur Reser Reservation, and had been caught out by a group of concerned and angry parents. Hmm. I don't really like any of those options. They should not buy the liquor in the first place, I interjected. These men do no wrong in selling it. The Tsutina men laughed bitterly. They come and sell their poison to our children and young people. They profit off destroying lives, and that is what you have to say? They shook their heads. A bottle of whiskey is more dangerous than a fist, or a bullet. Hmm. I looked at the eldest of the Tsutina men, who was watching the Cree boy with veiled sympathy. We have to fight to protect what's ours. These people profit from our softness, our kindness, so we must lock such feelings away. The hard-eyed American in the lead cleared his throat. Enough talk! He drew his pistol from his holster and settled into a shooter's stance. Time to settle this. Three more brown corpses won't even raise an eyebrow. I stood in front of the Tsutina as a shield. What about a white man's corpse, monsieur? Move away, friend. The gun did not waver, not even for a second. This is your last warning. Hmm. Don't do this, I cried, and he shot me. Well, he would have, if the Cree youth had not shoved me away and then collapsed on top of me. Oof, I huffed. The youth cast me an unreadable look and scrambled to his feet. He ran over to the whiskey traders as fast as his feet would carry him, and I didn't blame him in the least. But something tumbled out of his pocket and landed in the dirt. A rectangular device, blinking with green and yellow lights. I slipped it into my pocket, deciding that I would examine it at a more opportune time. The whiskey traders marched away with their charge, and by the time I dusted myself off, the Tsutina men had made themselves scarce as well. All that remained was yours truly, in an alley with bullet shells and blood spattered in the dirt, which was, of course, when the Northwest Mounted Police arrived and arrested me. I was released in a matter of hours with a stern warning, though I protested my innocence. I gave Monsieur Fogg a full accounting of my actions, despite the tightening of his lips. I think, he said after a chilly silence, that we have quite worn out our welcome in the city, Passport 2. It is past time to be on our way. Relations with Fogg have deteriorated slightly. Well, we're still allowed to be here, which is good. The mystery device should sell a good price in Toronto should we decide to sell it. I'm glad we have a device called the mystery device. Let's explore and see what happens. New routes have been discovered. Ooh, that's interesting. Where does this go? Toronto. I took a few hours to explore, investigating the various options for how we might consider, continue our journey. If we stop in the Regina Market, <laughs> we do have a mystery device now, worth $1,800 in Toronto. I have a feeling this has something to do with the Flying City, but I don't know. The accordion can be sold for £800. Let's sell that here. Probably going to want to go down to only three cases if we can manage it. The Walrus Tooth is valuable in New York, Atlanta, and Quebec City. The field glasses for the Air Traveler set. The Ushanka completes our Russian Gentleman set. Let's grab an Ushanka. Why not? And field glasses? Sure. 
Buy some field glasses. Don't know what they're for, but I'm sure we'll find out. There's nothing else here that's particularly valuable. If we uh, do try to sell our railway cap, it's worth 150 pounds here, which is not some small sum. If we're to plan our next journey, how do we get to Toronto? Departs tomorrow, arrives Saturday. Ooh, that is a slow way. The Crimson Petal. Leaves on a Wednesday, arrives on a Saturday. Well. Alternatively, the Winnipeg train also arrives Saturday, so it looks like we're not, uh... Not so full of options on that path. I guess it makes more sense for us to try and take the Crimson Petal. It's going to cost us 600 pounds to travel to Toronto, though. The last thing we want to do is be stranded. Here in Regina, we could sell some more things, but I don't think it makes much sense for us to do so. Instead, we'll pass the night and leave Regina. With the last light of the evening, I made certain to repack and iron everything to better prepare us for our inevitable departure. And our relationship with Fog has been strengthened. For now, we leave on the Crimson Petal. Let's go. I just don't know what this thing is, but it looks like a rocket ship, and I'm down for that. Airships ply the busy route from Regina to Toronto regularly. For us, it was simply a matter of picking a likely-looking ship and a reliable captain. Mormon Desert Railway is faster, cheaper, drier. What do you know? We found a railway route that absolutely won't help us at all. That's the value of checking the news. You'll often discover new routes that you haven't uh, heard of yet. We took passage aboard the Crimson Petal, a Savarkar Atmotic, no doubt brought over to Canada by British forces and then sold off when the army withdrew. Her engines were good and her hull solid, which was all we required for our purposes. I settled into the cabin I shared with Monsieur Fogg and let the whir of the engines lull me into sleep but I felt a buzzing in my pockets when I climbed into my berth. I rummaged around, curious, and pulled out the mysterious device the Cree youth had dropped. Its lights were flickering orange and blue. Strange, but it seemed harmless enough. Ah, mes amis, how wrong I was. Well, sounds like we're in for another adventure here. Let's chat with Fog, see how he's doing. The journey will be most expensive, monsieur. Indeed, but we can earn a little by buying and selling our possessions as we travel. Day 44. Yeah, he has nothing else to talk to us about. I have a feeling something most disastrous is about to occur. Oh, yes, indeed. I awoke in a strange compartment, with my hands bound to the bedpost. I looked around for Monsieur Fogg and saw him in similar straits, stretched out on the berth across from mine. Hmm... I gave him an encouraging smile, hoping to keep his spirits up in these trying circumstances. He did not seem to appreciate the gesture, if the roll of his eyes was any indicator. The compartment door slid open, admitting a tall, imposing woman in her prime. I am Winona Fire Thunder, of the Oglala Lakota tribe. She threw the mysterious device, now utterly quiescent at my feet. And you are whiskey traders come to open a new market, aren't you? <laughs> All right. We are no tradesmen, but gentlemen. I tried to give her a haughty look. Not an easy feat in bondage, mes amis, but needs must when the devil ties one up, as they say. Her face remained unmoved. Then why do you have one of our stolen signal devices? That's how we tracked you down. And back to business. All right. I think the better course for us here would be to say the truth. We never should have picked up the damn thing. I lamented. On that we agree, Madame Fire Thunder huffed. Anyway, save your breath for the council. They're the ones who will decide your fate. Oh, look, another council to decide our fate. Let's see here. Who is this council you speak of? I asked. Madame Fire Thunder glowered once again. We will reach the council tomorrow. I would get a good night's sleep, if that's even possible for the likes of you. With that, she swept out, leaving Monsieur Fogg and I with our increasingly unpleasant ponderings. Relations with Fogg have strengthened, though. Apparently, we're heading north instead. We're not going to Toronto after all. Let's check the news. Apparently, they left us some. 
Trinity Man Fog attempts round the world adventure. Alrighty. Apparently they're already printing headlines about it. Madame Fire Thunder dragged us from our cabin late in the afternoon. We have reached our destination, she said gruffly. I looked out of the observation windows and saw nothing but clouds. The woman laughed as we gained altitude. Look closer. It is the floating village of the Sioux. A chuckle bubbled from my throat. My god, that gossiping waiter was right. Madame Fire Thunder seized my arm roughly. What did you say? The Kahoka Otunwe, is it not? I sounded at the words carefully. I heard it was spotted near Regina. She gave me a searching look, but let me go. I rubbed my bruised arm, but was quickly distracted by the wondrous sight up ahead. The clouds resolved themselves into vast strips of silk, painted a mottled blue and white to camouflage the floating village from observation from below. What do we see? We saw vast engines churning behind the camouflage, straining to keep the massive bulk afloat. The largest were the four engines beneath the central mass, clearly the main propulsion system of the entire settlement. But that was not the most astonishing thing. As we drew closer, I realized it was no singular floating village, but rather made up of a churning, living mass of airships, all interlinked and docked together around the central mass. It was an ever-changing tumult of a settlement, floating improbably against the clouds. I was grateful to witness such a miracle. Indeed, I could barely even bring to mind the unfortunate circumstances that had brought me here. Madame Fire Thunder's stony expression cracked a little as the airship docked with the floating village. A complex maneuver of careful navigation, several wickedly sharp docking hooks, and, so it seemed to me, prayer. Welcome to my home, she said, and shoved me down the gangplank. Never mind, we're not going to an Insk after all. Where are we going? Quebec City! Okay. <laughs> If I had thought Madame Fire Thunder imposing, then the members of the council were downright terrifying. Every one of them had dark, intelligent eyes set in wrinkled faces, and many wore elaborate headdresses of bead and animal horn. They introduced themselves gravely. There were ten members of the council in total, five from the Sioux tribes, two Algonquians, one Iroquois, one Cree, and one forlorn temporary member, who seemed to represent miscellaneous others, so they put it in fancier terms. These are the whiskey traders, Madame Fire Thunder announced, pushing us before the assembled councillors. I found them, as I promised I would. I do not accept the legitimacy of this court. Wow. All right. Let's just say the truth here. We are not whiskey traders. I could not help a tiny little huff of irritation. This is most vexing. Silence! Madame Fire Thunder shouted as the councillors began to murmur to each other. Show some respect. Hmm. Let's tell the absolute and unvarnished truth. I feel that that's the most appropriate path here. Even though it seemed improbable to my own ears. I stuttered at the end of my tale and looked around at the impassive faces of the council. I searched each pair of eyes for sympathy and fancied I saw a glint of it here or there. Or so I hoped. What would they do to us if we were judged guilty? They conferred for a moment, several languages and unfamiliar dialects flying through the air, before the Cree counselor stood to deliver the verdict. Jean Passepartout and Phineas Fogg, we find you, he paused, not guilty. Madame Fire Thunder pressed her lips together and blew out her breath. It seems we owe you an apology, me in particular. No hard feelings, madame, I said gallantly. An understandable miscommunication. It's good of you to say so, she said grudgingly, leading us to a spacious hut in the central area of the floating village. I hope these accommodations will suffice till we reach Quebec City in two days' time. That's the closest it's safe for us to dock. Hmm. What do you mean, safe? We are tribespeople who refuse to live by the white man's law. We are hunted wherever we go. Quebec is one of the few sympathetic cities that trade with us, so we cannot risk anywhere closer. With that, she bowed low and left us to settle into our new unfamiliar accommodations aboard this miraculous floating village. 
I was eager to explore come the morrow. Well, well. Madame Firethunder offered to take us on a tour of the floating village. But for now, we're going to have to end this episode here. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. This has been Vanguard of Valor, playing a little bit of 80 Days for you. Depending on how long the next episode is, it might be tacked on the end here, so it might not be the end, but I have a feeling we're going to get one more episode out of this. So, thank you very much for watching, everybody. And until next time, bye bye